Uh, I'm Allison Hepler of the Woolwich Historical Society, and Bill Potter is uh, a Woolwich Fish Commissioner, and I'll be talking about the past, and he'll be talking about the present. So draw your attention to the town seal of Woolwich with a Native American hunter aiming his arrow and the Elwife fish house in the background. I don't know what the hunter's aiming at, but I do know it was not Elwives. Um, <laughs> the, but how, but the, Elwives, the arrival of the Elwives in the spring was the most welcome sight to the indigenous who lived in the area, which meant that he would have put down his bow and arrow and caught Elwives instead. Uh, alewives, or river herring, are anadromous fish, which means that they spawn in fresh water, spend most of their lives in salt water, and then head up uh, rivers and streams to fresh water to spawn. And, uh, and alewives have been part of Woolwich history since pre-European contact. According to early English explorer William Wood, the cod catch, impressive as it was, paled in comparison to the spring spawning runs of smelt, alewives, and sturgeon. Writing in 1633, Wood described it this way, quote, Alewives be a kind of fish which is much like a herring, which in the latter end of April come up the fresh rivers in such multitudes as is almost incredible, pressing up such shallow waters as will scarce permit them to swim, having likewise such longing desire after the freshwater ponds that no amount of beatings or forcive agitations by other devices will cause them to return to the sea until they have cast their spawn, end quote. Similarly, John Pory in 1622 observed, quote, another kind of fish which they call herring or old wives, alewives, in infinite schools into a great pond or lake of a mile broad where they cast their spawn, the water of said river being in many places not above a half foot deep. Yea, when a heap of stones is reared up against them a foot high above the water, they leap and tumble over and will not be beaten back with crudgels. Quote. Lots of, I guess that's how they caught them in the early days. Uh, but the, the point is there were lots of alewives. Um, little physical evidence remains of how Native Americans harvested alewives, but in 1674, Englishman John Jocelyn described natives using, quote, a net-like purse net put upon a round hooped stick with a handle in fresh ponds, end quote. There are also descriptions of intricately woven sticks designed to, cat, uh, to trap the fish, like a sort of weir. Uh, what we also know is that natives in New England lived and gathered food seasonally, with Maine natives um, who lived near the coast acquiring well over half of their food supply from the rivers and the seashore. These spawning runs were the major source of food from March through May, followed by ground fish, shellfish, and offshore cod. Um, taking advantage of the ecology of the alewife, natives knew that alewives brought migratory birds as well as their eggs. Um, Migratory bird, uh, migratory bird in um, flight with a poor alewife attached to its talons. Uh, this was a picture by Howard uh, Cedarland. Um, so where are we talking about? Um, this is the Kennebec. This is Bath right there, um, Hanson Bay, and then this is Nequasset Stream up here, and this is the the center of town. There's Nequasset Pond right there. Um, this is on a mo uh, modern map where we're talking about Route 1, and so we're talking about this area right there. This was the center of town because it was the center of commerce. It was one of the first areas of Woolwich to be developed, and settlers were drawn to the accessible water, both salt water, as you see in the foreground, and fresh water behind it, and to the falls for the mills. Uh, meeting House, which still stands, was built in 1757. The cemetery was in place by 1775, uh, both, which is also still there, and there was a post office, stores, and a tannery. The first sawmill in Nequasset may have been as early as 1658, built and used by the Clark and Lake settlement on Arousic Island. Uh, it was abandoned in the wake of King Philip's War. The next sawmill was built probably in 1719. The combination, however, of continued violence and floods kept any permanent mills away from the area until 1740, when Thomas Paine from Boston established a grist mill. Um, by the 1770s, uh, several mills had been built on both sides of the dam, sawmills and at least one fulling mill. But the lumber industry was the most prevalent. Uh, this is a scene at Nequasset as, early as, the, uh, as late as the early 20th century, described by Fred Gilmore. Quote, at the far east side was constructed a log chute. Logs were cut in the winter around the lake and later rafted down. 
People watched, gathered to watch as the logs were herded by pick poles and one by one had its merry ride down into Nequasset Creek where rafts of logs were then towed down to be sawed at Spinney's Tide Mill on the edge of Arousic Island, end quote. Gilmore also described a timber landing below the falls. Quote, a scow there was loading ship's timbers cut in the forest nearby, hauled by oxen to be delivered by the scow, or it sometimes would be a gundalo, to the shipyard and bath. By the 20th century, the sawmill was owned by the town and operated by a number of different men into the 1950s. Um, while all of this economic activity was going on, there was the matter of alewives moving into the same spot. So I want to turn back to the town logo again. And what we're looking at with the building um, is the European way of harvesting and managing alewife runs. Um, it's hard to know when the first dam that spanned the waterway was built. It's likely that Mr. Payne in 1740 built the first one, uh, probably when he built the grist mill. We, do, we know that a new dam was built between 1770 and 1775, and another new one built in 1825 and some subsequent to that. Um, the colony of Massachusetts, going back to the colonial days, mandated the passage of alewives through, through dams. In 1735, we see here, legislation <laughs> mandated a convenient sluice or passage for fish that, quote, have been accustomed to pass into ponds, with penalties for dam owners who didn't comply. So important were alewives as a source of food that local residents rose up against mill owners who, um, who tried to build dams for power without such a passage. And local governments, who would otherwise have to feed these poor people themselves, supported them over the, um, over the mill owners. Um, in Woolwich, then, regardless of what or whose mills were used, uh, used the power to run their businesses, alewives were protected as a town resource. One of the first town officials after Woolwich was incorporated in 1759 was the fish commissioner whose job it was to uphold the law regarding a passage for ye fish. Um, subsequent town meetings reflect great interest in conservation. Woolwich residents limited harvest days and established fines for visitors. The fish commission today still makes that determination. So um, alewives, Europeans and alewife harvesting. The first thing Europeans did was, after beating them, um, caught them and, uh, and ate them. Uh, this is a recipe that comes from the Woolwich History Book. I've also seen another one, I think, from Margaret Gardner that encourages cooking, over carefully cooking, and then throwing the whole mess out and going to a restaurant. <laughs> so, so they ate them fresh, and they also smoked them. Um, eating them, smoking them is what. Um. And we don't know a lot about the early years of this settlement in Woolwich, but Europeans farmed the New England land intensively. And as a result, one early use of alewives was for fertilizer. Contrary to the well-known story of Squanto, and, or to Squantum, and his um, sojourn uh, and teaching the Plymouth colonists right, to plant corn by putting a fish in the soil, Squanto likely learned this from his sojourn in England and not from New England native practices. Uh, Indian farming in northern New England was limited, and natives simply abandoned fields that became nutritionally exhausted. In contrast, Europeans used alewives extensively for fertilizer, with an industry in Massachusetts as early as the 1630s, in part because they grew maize extensively, which put great demands on the soil, and in part because they didn't house their livestock in barns at night, thus eliminating another source of, um, of manure. John Pory in 1622 reported, quote, the inhabitants during the said two months take them up every day in hogsheads. And with those they eat not, they manure the ground, burying two or three in each hill of corn. According to historian John William Cronin, the fish did a good job for the soil, but attracted wild animals, and in the end tended to spoil fields with their oiliness. Um, also, if you've been around alewives for a while, you know that it smells. Um, farmers got used to it. Ale travelers and passersby never did. Um, two other things. European use of the land impacted alewives in two other ways. Um, alewives as pig food allowed settlers to expand their swine population, which greatly changed the New England landscape. And also the decimation of the beaver population um, led to the loss of habitat for alewives. Um, some of those freshwater ponds so favored by the spawning fish collapsed at the, with the loss of beavers. Um, and then finally, lobster bait today. Uh, I met, I've met lobstermen down there who only lobster when alewives are running. Um, and we're going to move to here. Just can, is this going to be in your way? 
Okay. It's when you let go of the thing that the thing that it moves. Yeah. <coughs> Allison's talked uh, about the local history and the culture with Elwise. What I'm going to talk about is is the um, the harvest that we're doing today and the stewardship that we're employing to make sure we have a harvest in the future. Uh, this picture you saw, or I think one version of it, what it shows is the old mills and the stone dam of the uh, early 1900s. And these buildings had been either deeded over, sold, whatever. But the town of Woolwich ended up as being the owner of this dam and, and uh, the buildings that you see. Uh, in 1920, the, uh, the legislature passed laws that allowed the uh, fresh water systems of the state to be enhanced, and part of that was that the Bath Water District took this property all muchly over um, the buildings and the dam um, by eminent domain. Uh, that wasn't the end of it, um, but they ended up with uh, all of this property. And as I said, they were, their objective was to uh, enhance the water supply of Bath. <clears throat> the fish ladder at that time, I think you can see it on the left, but it was mostly just stone pools that, that allowed the fish to, to flow upstream uh, and over the dam. Dam was much lower than it is now. Uh, another picture uh, shows uh, the, same, the same time frame, but the following year from when the buildings and the, and the land were taken by eminent domain, um, the uh, negotiations continued, and from reading the historical records and the deeds, I would imagine it was quite intense. Uh, and as it turned out, the water district returned all of this property to the town, and uh, the water district ended up with an easement on town property for the, uh, for the dam and the, and the opportunity to improve the dam. Uh, one other thing that I'd like to point out from this picture is uh, is that millstone right there. And I, I sus it's still there, although it's pretty well hidden at this point. Uh, but it kind of confirms the fact that there was a, a lot of mills at this spot. This is a, this is a lumber mill, uh, but there was obviously a grist mill that uh, uh, existed there at some time. Uh, the, the easement that <clears throat> the Bath Water District uh, um, received uh, not only provided them the property and the rights to a dam, but it also clarified <clears throat> the fishing rights that the town had and the responsibilities that the Water District has in the town. Um, and it required the Bath Water District to maintain a fish ladder over the dam. And at some point, the, uh, and I'm not sure when this happened, but the fish commissioners that I'm one of today uh, were giving the uh, were designated to be the uh, the managers of the town's responsibilities, and I'll go over those in a couple minutes. Uh, jumping into uh, into today, um, what we have now is uh, at every town meeting, every yearly town meeting in Woolwich, where we have an election for a fish commissioner. It's usually a highly contested uh, position. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the Fish Commission is, is five. They're charged with the responsibility to manage the uh, LY privileges. And this, this means we have, to, we have to comply with the, uh, the state of Maine and the federal fisheries experts. Um, and and we, use a, uh, we use a harvester. We're not actually fishermen. We're really contractors. So we, we select a, a harvester. And he's allowed to fish four days a week by the, by the state laws. Um, he has to also regulate the water up the fish ladder. This, this fish ladder is not self-regulating. It requires the removal of, of planks to uh, lower the water or raise the water, depending on what the lake level is. So he's responsible to make sure that we get the right water level in the fish ladder when the migration's taking place. He also has to regulate it in the later part of the years when the the juvenile fish, the young fish, coming out of the hatch, want to go back down the river, and that's quite interesting to watch. Probably as interesting as uh, as watching the migration up the ladder. He also sets the price that he wants to sell the fish for to the fishermen, 
and he smokes uh, a few for uh, human consumption. And for all of this, uh, he pays the town uh, a, a fixed amount of money per bushel, depending on what the catch is. He pays, he pays the town uh, a flat rate for each bushel that we hold in escrow, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, we also have some responsibilities that include maintaining these buildings. Uh, they're old. They're, uh, they, as Allison pointed out, they appear on the town seal and are considered significant to the town. They're also in a location that is uh, very subject to violent flooding. And I don't have a picture of it, but I can, I can tell you that the, when the water is coming over the dam at a good rate, uh, the water on the side of the building is up three feet. So the, the whole building is a wash. Uh, also, the, the buildings that, that I had inherited when I uh, became a fish commissioner were, looked like they were made from reclaimed material from the old mills. And as you saw, the old mills are pretty decrepit. They did manage to salvage some timbers and some boards and were able to build a smaller building. The end result of all of that is uh, we, uh, we've had a lot of maintenance, as you'll see in some of the later pitches, and, um, but we pay for these, this maintenance up till now with, uh, with money that we get out of the fish catch. So it's not a town cost, it's, a, it's really a fish way that is self-sustaining. Uh, we have to deal with the state government. <coughs> uh, the Department of Marine Resources is uh, the people that give us authorization to manage the fish. Um, we have to submit a management plan every year. That's just like just like the BIW and the U.S. Navy. You got to have a management plan. We have to allow the state to take samples during the harvest. Uh, we require the harvester to get licenses and and to put together a report of what the catch really was. And then there's an outfit called the Federal Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission that oversees DMR and us, and they've been up to look at our facility and to uh, critique what we do. Uh, but their, their charter is to increase the health of the uh, LY fisheries on the East Coast. Um, they, they dictate where LYs can be harvested. And at this point in time, or as, as of last year, the only place that was harvesting uh, LYs on the East Coast uh, is here in Maine. And at one point, there were 17 fisheries. And I, I have no idea where that stands right now. But we believe we will be catching in 2013 is what we've been led to believe. This isn't as good a picture as Allison had, but uh, the run is pretty, uh, there's a lot of fish in the run. Um, they, they have a real herd instinct. When one goes, they kind of all follow along. Uh, and, and they might set off in the, in the stream for a day or two and just kind of mill around and not run up the ladder. And then all of a sudden, one gets brave, and they come into the, into the ladder area. Uh, this picture is uh, a shot of the fish ladder. And I'll kind of explain what's going on here. Probably have seen some of it. But the fish come up the river into the stream, come up the stream, and they end up, there's a, there's a series of little waterfalls that run up into this. This collects the water from both coming down the ladder and also through the trap area. And uh, the fish end up in there, in this pool. And they'll swim around for a while. And some of them will decide to go up the fish ladder and into the lake. And, and a lot of them will decide it's a lot easier to go into the, into the trap area, which is this, this affair. And they'll, uh, they'll, they'll take the trap route and end up becoming bait. Um, I think it's kind of cute that if you go right, you get away and get into the lake. You go left, <laughs> <laughs> you, ha, end, ha, you, ha. you end up as food. <laughs> oh, there's, there's one other thing I'd like to show that goes into the rest of the speech here. You look at this, and you look at some of the new wood in these baffles, um, which set the stages for the, for the ladder. You see that a lot of new wood in the ladder and a lot of distressed concrete that is... Uh, fast uh, deteriorating. We'll talk a little bit about more of that. Next thing I wanted to talk about was the, the harvester. He's the guy that does all the work, makes big bucks, and uh, <laughs> he, uh, he is kind of a labor of love, I think, at this point. But this is, uh, this is the trap. It's, a, it's an electric chain fall that, and a net that uh, we drive the fish into. 
the net is picked up by the chain fall and they dump them into the box that's behind it. Um, we, we've chosen the harvester two ways in the past. We've gone out for the high bidder uh, and we've had negotiated settlements, uh, uh, selection, excuse me, negotiated selections. Um, we found that the negotiated selection is the best way because we end up with an experienced harvester that's familiar with both our fishery which has its quirks, and who the lobstermen customers are. So it becomes a balance between the harvest and long-term fishery um, that he has to, he has to uh, provide. Um, he has to be responsible for the DMR. They check up on him periodically, both with the, uh, with the wardens and also with the biologists who'll come by and grab some samples or whatever. And he also has to provide an acceptable payment to the town. Uh, the, the people that have done the harvest, as long as I've known, but there have been others, uh, has been the Lilly family. I've heard some town people think that the Lilly family had a lock on this, but just because there's been three generations, they really, <laughs> they really haven't had a lock on it. <laughs> this, this man on the, on the right in the plaid shirt is, uh, is a, is a half-brother to the Lilly family. Uh, he's, he does a lot of the day-to-day -day work. Uh, Herb Lilly is his half-brother and he actually manages it. But what you see here is the fish being dipped out of the, out of the pool area and uh, they either are dipped out uh, as they come in to meet customer needs. And, and we'll see customers, we'll see fishermen spend the night in the car so they'll be first in line. Because it's good bait. You know, it's much better than you can buy uh, um, locally in the, in the fishing area. So they'll drive quite a distance and they'll wait a long while for the fish run. Um, but if there's too many, in some days we'll see a hundred bushels of, of Elwise uh, come into the trap area and if, and, and if it's difficult to sell them all that day, there's a, in front of Steve's uh, foot, there's a screen that'll be opened up and the Elwise will continue to migrate up into the pool behind him and uh, they'll basically be wet storage waiting for fishermen. Allison showed a picture of uh, LYs being dumped, just another view of the same thing, sold, as, sold by the bushel, and a bushel, just for your amazement, is uh, about 120 fish, something like that, depending on the size of them. Um, here we have Steve and one of the fishermen uh, ready for loading into the truck. We, we do have a access down right to the fish house. Um, and they'll, they'll buy uh, up to four bushel at a time, um, mainly because there's usually more fishermen at, at a given time than there are fish. So we limit them to four bushel, but if there are some left after the first go around, we let them go around again. Uh, we also, uh, the, the, uh, the harvester will get on the phone and, and make calls to, uh, to steady customers and uh, they'll come in and, and help unload a big, a big catch. So what's all that look like uh, uh, as far as uh, what we've seen over the last 20 years or so? Uh, you can see a big dip. Uh, you can see that uh, the end of the 2009, I guess it is on that, sl on that slide, uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good, pretty good catch. Around uh, 800 to 1,000 bushels in a year. Uh, but I would, and and since then, uh, it's been in the same order. Last year was about 1,100 bushels. So, so it's uh, uh, it's been pretty strong. But I, I would point out, from my observation, that there's a lot of factors uh, on what happens with the with the catch. Uh, it isn't all what the uh, biology is out at sea. It's, it, it deals with a lot of local things like the weather on fishing days. We, we limit them to certain days. Um, the state limits us and we limit the harvester. Uh, and if it's, it happens to be warm and sunny during the days that you can fish, you tend to get more fish. Uh, if you have a lot of rain uh, during the harvest or before the harvest and it damages the latter, um, that disrupts the fishing. And Allison showed a lot of, a lot of pictures uh, of the predatory birds that are there. I, I also can say that in the, in the pool where the, where, the, where the fish circle, the, uh, 
the juvenile fish coming down will, will circulate in that in, in, as well. And I happened to be there one day and there was a, uh, a snap, snapping turtle, snapping turtle um, right, in the, right in the pool and all this, this uh, big school of juvenile <laughs> fish was swimming around and every time, you know, he'd, he'd take, a, take a mouthful. <laughs> and, and they were oblivious to the fact that he was there. I mean, I thought it was amazing. Uh, Steve also talked, uh, uh, Allison also talked about selling some of them. Uh, my picture of, uh, uh, of Steve and his uh, st string of fish. Um, my, my answer to that is, it's an acquired taste. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of responsibilities. Uh, you know, when I get into this job, I said to myself, this is a pretty laid back group. Nothing ever happens. But <laughs> since I've been on the committee, we've had to rebuild the building and, and a bunch of other things that were like making these speeches. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we, uh, we have had to do considerable maintenance over the last five years. <clears throat> Here you see uh, the new timber frames. We started out, we were going to re-roof the, re -roof, the uh, roof, and we thought we might have to replace some boards. Uh, maybe the purlins were a little bad, but we had no doubt those, those uh, 8 by 10 or 8 by 12 uh, trusses that were in there had to be sound. They looked good from the bottom. <laughs> well, once you got the roof off, uh, you found that the trusses were totally rotted out on the inside. Years of linkage in the roof. and. Uh, so anyway, we, uh, we had a, in, in 2011, we had a major undertaking uh, to uh, replace the roof. Another picture, we, uh, we used local builders, town of Woolwich builders, uh, John Nybodger. Uh, he did the roofing and the boarding and all of that, and I hired at the last minute uh, Gaius Hennen and Hennen Post and Beam to, uh, to build some trusses and to come in and put them in place. Uh, using the crane truck and they were working to a pretty tight schedule and uh, and our budget wasn't uh, unlimited either I can tell you that we I, I had a few nights where I wondered if we we're going to be able to pay for it um, so this picture shows uh, the new roof installed uh, it looks white because that's the first snow uh, they finished on Friday and snowed that weekend um, Overall, a big sigh of relief on my part. We got the job done before winter, which was my big fear. We had enough money to pay for it, and uh, we've been very pleased with the outcome. Um, the next part of the story is uh, the Bath Water District also recognizes that their fish ladder is in uh, bad need of repair, um, and uh, they enlisted uh, kelp to uh, to kind of program manage that activity. Young lady's gonna talk here in a couple of minutes. Um, but anyway, part of that activity is getting money. Try to go out and get, you know, shake the trees and get some uh, grant money from wherever it comes. And uh, part of what Alicia has done is put together a counting program, which I kind of snickered at, but um, I did it. Uh, good fisherman. But anyway, here's a, here's a picture of me and uh, my number two granddaughter, Fiona. And she's got the counter and I got the stopwatch and, you, and the, way Allison, uh, the way Alicia set it up was, uh, was uh, fixed periods of time, randomly, not random, but predictably sp spread over the fishing day. Um, also, uh, we... Uh, we have, we have the easement that I mentioned earlier, and we need to update that. I mean, the, 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 the old fish ladder didn't really fit on the easement property from what I can see, and the new one's going to be bigger. So, so we need to rewrite the easement, and uh, uh, we've, had a, we've had a law firm that's been helping uh, the water district uh, to come up with a modified easement that we can register in the courthouse. Uh, we also had the, the dam property surveyed and had a title search done on it, and that's how we found out that we own all the land and that there's ultimately an easement that uh, gives the water district the right to do this. So it's been a, it's been a learning experience, uh, and some of it has been, uh, I mean, I, I watched my granddaughter, and they all, I got three of them that involved, and they, uh, 
They all enjoyed doing it, and I don't think they missed a fish. <laughs> so uh, here we are. This is, uh, this is kind of the, the way we want to see it. Uh, fishing's at the right level. A uh, few spectators watching the migration. Um, large volume of fish going up the ladder. Uh, the adult fishes that go into the lake actually return, and they're coming down the ladder, and then shortly thereafter, we had the juveniles that, that showed up, and they went down the ladder. But it's a nice, peaceful scene. But as I mentioned, uh, it isn't always that way. <laughs> this, this picture was, uh, was last year. We had a lot of rain last year, right before, the, uh, right before the season, which kind of beat up the ladder. And then this storm was in the middle of the year, middle of the season, and uh, it knocked out a bunch of the baffles. And uh, you know the water level was so high that there was no fish that could uh, <laughs> Uh, that reflects about, I think, seven and a half inches over a couple of days uh, running over the dam. Um, this is the spot. If you look, at there's a sign there in the middle of it. That's where Fiona and I were standing uh, just a few days before. And that's where the slot is that feeds the fish ladder. And in case you can't read the sign, uh, it says, please don't handle the fish. And really, there wasn't much to worry about that day. <laughs> But one worry that we've had that I'm hoping we're going to address in this fish ladder is uh, this sign actually got stolen. As soon as the water went down, someone, someone made off with it. And uh, it's, you know, it's a sign that's been around a long while and was kind of sad to see it go. But vandalism is something that we cope with. And, and really, in today's uh, environment where everybody gets sued, uh, you, know, you don't want to have an accident-prone facility. And if there is one, this is it. A lot of water going over the dam, but when the water goes away, the slipperiness usually lasts for several days after. So, so we're concerned about it, and uh, hopefully we're going to address security at the dam so that you can still see it, but you won't be out there walking up the side of those cement, crumbling cement uh, fish ladder. Well, my last slide is, uh, actually it's Allison's slide. I liked it, but... Uh, this kind of takes you back a little bit. Uh, it's a historical meeting. And if you look at the picture, you know, you see Steve, uh, Steve driving the fish into the net. You got several people, fishermen, hanging around waiting to get their turn and to buy the fish. Uh, maybe, uh, I guess probably the lady in the front row, she's just hanging out. And it's a nice, peaceful scene. Uh, this picture was last year, but it could have been 50 years ago. And uh, if it was, it, only the players would be different. And I think it's kind of nice that in a rapidly changing world, that to be able to slow down to an earlier time and in some instance of your life is uh, worthwhile. Allison's going to. Uh, yeah. A few more. So, um, building on what what. Uh, uh, that very point, um, uh, we wanted to leave you with three images. Uh, I'm a historian, Bill's an engineer, but what strikes us both by looking at this photo from the early 1900s, the Down East cover from 1971, and today is really how little has changed, right? Uh, not only do we have the human continuity, as Bill mentioned, with generations of good stewardship of the harvest, but in the architectural details as well. Um, not to mention the same fish, or at least their um, great, great grandkids. Um, <laughs> speaking of which, um, I have one final little um, short uh, PSA. Uh, the counting continues. Um, Alicia Hayburn here from uh, Kennebec Estuary Land Trust um, have, has organized another eyeball count of the fish again this time. Some of you may have been counters last year. Um, if you're interested, you should, um, Alicia's Leave again right there, um, who's here today. And surely you can do a better job than the two people in the upper right corner um, <laughs> who are looking anywhere but where they should be. Um, <laughs> me? No. No, no. Um, this is the flyer. Um, this is, you can pick up a flyer that looks like this. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, we'll take any questions.
if I could just to have maybe two minutes to talk about the future chapter of the fishway because I have been part of the restoration of the fish ladder for almost two years now and started at completely square one. And it has been the most amazing project to work on behalf of the Kennebec Estuary Land Trust, the town of Woolwich and the water district to try to bring this fish ladder back into its full functionality. We were calling it the restoration project we got to rename that. It's a total rebuild. There's really very little to save. Kind of the way Bill ended up putting on not only a new roof, but new trusses and all those beautiful beams on the fish house. We're going to go down to square one and take out the concrete and build it back up again. With the same intention as the town has had since 19, 1735, we've got to pass those fish over the dam and into the lake. So our hope is that this summer, we will have accumulated sufficient grant funds. It's about a $350,000 project. Um, we've had strong contributions from the Water District. The NOAA has given us significant money. We have grant applications out to several other places so that we can blast out what's there and rebuild it for another 50, 60, 70 years of use. The current ladder was put in in 1955. Um, and thankfully, we have a lot of interest. It's been so fun to work on this project because every place I turn, it seems that Nequasset, a potentially small, maybe some would say insignificant fish run, is touted as an absolutely amazing example of locally based resource restoration. I was at a talk in Boston on Wednesday night, and they said, we're restoring the Gulf of Maine, and we're doing it one stream at a time, one community at a time. And because this fish ladder is right off of Route 1, and the town knows about it, and it's on the town seal, and you have these dedicated commissioners and historical society and town officials who love it, this project is happening in record time. And so it really is a model for restoration for the entire Gulf of Maine. We bring these alewives back, we're going to get the cod, we're going to get the salmon, we're going to get the striped bass, and it's a, it's a wonderful story. So. If you're interested in getting a little closer to the fish and you want to come out and spend 10, 20, 30 minutes of your time uh, in the month of May or the first week of June, I have a handout and you can go to the Kennebec Estuary Land Trust website and we would love to have you there. Thank you very much.